Thanks so much for joining us today, Katrina. Can you walk us through the report's main findings? Yeah, so overall, we found that there was fairly widespread declines in salmon abundance across all six species of Pacific salmon and in all nine major salmon bearing regions in Western Canada. And we found that out of the 41 different combinations of species and regions, more than 70% of them were below their long term average abundance. So that was the main finding. And within that, we also found that two species, in particular chum and steelhead, were doing the worst with abundances below the long-term average in every single region we looked at. In addition to that, we also found that northern regions within Western Canada had the most widespread declines. And this is something that was concerning for us, given that northern regions are warming faster than the rest of Canada. But we did find some hope. We, we do see some encouraging signs of recovery, and we point out some of those examples within our report. Yeah, like you said, the report states the, uh, the northernmost regions of BC and the Yukon are, are warming faster than the rest of Canada. What impact does that have on salmon? Yeah, it certainly is having impacts on freshwater environments and marine environments as well. On the freshwater side, you know, with a rapidly warming climate, we're starting to see stream temperatures increase and in testing salmon. So salmon can only survive in freshwater up to a certain upper limit. And in many years, in many places in northern regions, we're starting to see that thermal limit be exceeded. In addition to that, we have persistent drought in some regions that are leading to low flows, uh, and these are leading to challenges for salmon survival, causing more stress, uh, leading to more pre-spawn mortality. And then in the marine environment, you know, we're seeing warming of the ocean, and this is having a number of ecosystem level effects, including, you know, providing less nutritious food that salmon in northern regions like to predate on. You're seeing less nutritious food uh, brought about in part by a warming ocean. And then you're also seeing kind of more competition for a finite amount of habitat. You know, there, there's more salmon, it might be surprising to hear there's more salmon in the ocean than there have been over the past hundred years. Um, but more salmon means more mouths to feed. And then, as I said, less nutritious food. And so it's creating heightened competition that is adversely affecting salmon survival. What action do you think needs to be taken and by who to protect the salmon? Yeah, I think that there's a lot of things that we can do. I think, you know, first and foremost, I think we can preserve and protect the salmon habitats that are intact and high functioning. And these same habitats tend to be refuges for salmon. They are more productive. Um, you've got lots of genetic diversity. So protecting those habitats that we know are intact is a key strategy. And in particular, when we're thinking about those habitats, we can be more forward looking. We can ask ourselves which of these habitats are likely to be more resilient to a rapidly changing climate. You know, as an example of that, you know, some habitats have natural uh, climate refuges. They'll have places of cold water uh, upwelling and protecting habitats that have those climate refuges are gonna help salmon adapt in a changing environment. I think that's one key part. Another key part is just minimizing the impacts fisheries have on at-risk populations. And there's good examples of how that can be done by having more selective fisheries. You know, for example, in the NAS, the Nishka First Nation, they operate a fish wheel where they have a fairly intensive monitoring program in place to count returning salmon. They know which populations, which species, and how many are coming back real time in season. And they use that in information to inform their fisheries to make sure that they're minimizing impacts to at-risk populations and are harvesting those that are more abundant. And that's kind of an example, but it's a key strategy that we can employ in order to have more sustainable fishing opportunities. Um, the last piece I would just say is also addressing some pretty critical data gaps that we found. So a key part to protecting and preserving wild salmon is understanding how they're doing. And we couldn't do that everywhere. There were some areas and for some species where there wasn't enough information that we're collecting that we really just don't know how salmon are doing. And so knowing when and how to intervene is a problem if you don't know where you're starting from. Yeah, and like you said, Katrina, the report also found there were signs of hope when it comes to the salmon. Can you tell us any more about that? 
Yeah, so some great examples of hope um, would be in the southern parts of BC. One example that we highlight in our report is Fraser Coho. And as you might know, Fraser Coho actually crashed in about the mid 1990s. They were highly abundant in the early 80s, but then they declined by over 60%. And at the time, there was some pretty stark measures put in place, including an almost complete ban on fisheries. Yeah. And that's been in place for a couple decades. And it's only in recent years that we're starting to see Coho numbers come back above their long-term average. And so this really provides hope that we can put measures in place that we can see signs of recovery if we you know, limit human actions, put fishery um, uh, bans in place, yeah. but also invest in salmon recovery, which is also a key aspect of the recovery here. Well, we'll have to leave it there, Katrina. Thank you for your time for talking about this important report. My pleasure. Thank you.